how do you sort of like put a label on somebody like this guy, Craig Hornby? Um, filmmaker? Campaigner? Sure. Um, environmental vanguard? <laughs> I thought you said vandal there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you don't you don't have to put a label on. I'm just me, and I do what I do. Oh, just it's all, proud it's, all, of, it's all part of it, you know. Or proud of where you're from. Sure, I care about where I'm from. Yeah, of course, I care about I care about this area, I care about the planet, really. Born in South Bank. Yeah, a few years ago now. Yeah, um, I think probably what a lot of people will know you for. Yeah across the entire region is A Century in Stone which was an amazing film that went around the world and then around again you know, mm. and around again and it's still going round isn't and it? And it still goes on and um, I, get, I get emails and I, I get emails from around the world still from people who are just discovering it and I get, I'm getting a new generation of people coming up now who get to a certain point in life maybe in the 30s and they start to like they're asking me Wow, this is a great film, you know. I never, know, I never heard about this because they were probably too young, being young, ten years ago when it came out. It's ten years since we started showing it, since I finished and launched it. Yeah, ten years ago we were taking it around the pubs and clubs. We did something like thirty odd nights from from Stockton right across to like Skin and Grove, Loftus. We went from Grange Town to Great Aden, village halls, pubs, clubs, packed them out night after night. It was a it was a dream come true for me because that was the idea, you know. To get people to realise that there's a film on at the end of your street <laughs> that you need to go and see. And on the back of the, the thousands of people who came, we took it to the Ark and it broke the box office records off the wall. And it, it stood for a long time till I think there was a Jamie Bell uh, film on where he was there. <laughs> and then it was like, you know, fair enough, you know. But um, And then after that, of course, by the September of 04, it was on at uh, UGC, Cineworld now, you know. It was the first ever Teesside made film on at a multiplex in Teesside. And it was the big biggest pull of that week. And it ran for like three or four weeks. And then um, after that, it was... Um, and they put me in touch with a cinema next to the Opera House in Sydney Harbour. Because of the bridge being made by Dorman Long, who owned the Eston Mines, some of yeah. the Eston Ironstone went into that bridge, you know. And it's, our, it's a great legacy of Teesside industry, you know, 10,000 miles away on the other side of the world. And so um, I hired the cinema next next to the opera house, opposite the bridge, and it opened there in August 05, and it ran for four days. On the back of that screen, on the back of that booking, which is really prestigious, right in the centre of Sydney there, right? And we got Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth and Newcastle, New South Wales, you know. Which is a very big steel town as well. Exactly, and I got off at at Newcastle. It was the last uh, leg of the tour, right? It had been an amazing time, a total dream dream, uh, situation for me, absolutely. Um, I got off at the station, the train station, a few hours north of Sydney, and all the girders on the station have got Dorman Long, Middlesbrough stamped on them. Plain as day. You see them all across Australia. I saw them in Adelaide. I, I saw them in Melbourne. I saw, I saw a flatbed truck with girders for like a chassis. It had cargo fleet stamped on the side. You know, it's ten years though. It is, yeah, yeah. It's a quite incredible, isn't it? It is, and it goes on, and um, and still the day I'm, I'm still um, taking school parties up Eston Hills on my uh, on my like I do this Eston Miners hike. I take uh, ten year old kids every year um, from Normanby Primary School. And we did, were up there the other week, you know, 60, 10-year-olds. And I take them on a six-mile, six-hour hike. <laughs> Bet the parents t- love you. Do. Well, one year, <laughs> the, kid, the, get back. The, the kids and the teachers were so into it. Like, last year, we got there about, we got back about half past four. <laughs> <laughs> the, the kids were covered in mud and they were so... They had a brilliant day and uh, the parents were fine, like, you know. But uh, you're teaching the next generation about it. And that was the idea that why it was made, because all of those old people in the film, there was a dozen ex-miners... Miners' wives, there was a miners' hospital nurse, there was two ladies who were born on the moor, at Barnaby Moor, pit top of the village that is long gone, of course. Now, they were all, they were all in the film, and, and I told them at the time, I said, you're, you're immortalised now. Long after all of us have gone, people will still be able to watch this film and find out about the people's history, the working-class experience of life in industrial Teesside. And now it started with, you know, digging out the foundations from beneath Eston Hills, you know. What made you want to do it in the first place? I know, because you've always been into film. You, when you went to college and, yeah. you know, you, you went as, as a filmmaker, it's always interesting. Well, you. I, went, I went to art college when I was like, um, uh, well, I went when I first left school for a bit, then I left and I got a YTS and I didn't think that was a good uh, idea. So I got, I, got, um, I got sacked off my YTS for having too many opinions. 
which didn't really fit, you know. Um, you had to write, a, you, you, got a, you got like a logbook every week on your YTS. We were the first year of YTS, you had a logbook and you had to write in what you learned that week and they didn't like what I was writing. I was writing the truth, but they couldn't, couldn't stand any opinion. So I was sort of a, a sacked and um, oh, anyway, I got back to art college <clears throat> and um, when I was like 19 and, um, and I discovered film, chanced upon it, never thought I would before in my life. And it was a six-week module. Century in Stone was supposed to take six weeks. And it was a historical thing. Make a film about somebody who lived between 1850 and 1950. And make a little sort of a three-minute film about... Like, that's all it was. It was like almost a storyboard. You didn't, you didn't even get to make the film. Well, I was like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, and I was walking through Middlesbrough. And I saw Balco's statue. I went, oh, that'll be good. I'll come down here and get some of these old buildings. That'll be pretty interesting. I went to the reference library in Middlesbrough, upstairs... I got a book about Bolgo, I sat down, um, and it was a life-changing epiphany moment. I mean, absolutely. I, I read and I saw Bolgo was the proprietor of the Eston Mines. The mine was the biggest ironstone mine in the world. It was the foundation upon which Middlesbrough became that great infant Hercules. And I was like, wow, it was important, this thing. I, I've played on the ruins as a kid. And I didn't think it was that important. It was just, it, nobody really knew about it. It was forgotten about. Um... And suddenly, it's um, it's important. Hmm. It's uh, it's absolutely the, it underpinned Middlesbrough's epic growth into the iron making capital of the entire world, right? And it only closed in 1949. So I sort of did my maths and I said, well, it's 1988 now, 89, and actually uh, maybe there was some old boys still around who worked there as young men. So that became my mission to try and find a miner. I wanted to know about the uh, you know the working class experience, basically. The statues to Bolko and Vaughan, who were the men who did the work, who died in those tunnels, yep. who had a hell of a life, you know, no doubt. And uh, and I managed to find one. And he told me about a couple of his mates who were still around, and that's how I started, you see. I met I met George Appleby, and he was eight, he was 91-year-old. I was 21. He was 91. And we'd go to Western Institute, and we'd have a pint together. And uh, I was absolutely transfixed, because his knowledge was vast, and he worked deep under the under Eston Hills, two two and three miles in, um, in all kind. Of, he had this whole language, and he, he painted a picture of how it was underground. It was a vast maze of tunnels, um, and I was just you know these people were going to go, and they were going to take it with them. Nothing was documented really, nothing was recorded, and I had a chance to make a short <clears> film. <throat> so I said. I want to make a proper film about it. And I went back to the college. I'd disappeared for weeks researching. And they said, Craig, where have you been for weeks? You're on the, you're on the verge of getting kicked out of here, you know. I said, look, I said, I found my I found my thing. This is what I've got to do, you know. Cause before then, I was kind of not quite committed. I was a bit vague, you know. And I said, look, I found all this stuff. Some archive recordings of uh, sound recordings. I've got photographs drawings, I've took pictures myself I said there's tons of stuff here for a film I want to make this a proper proper documentary of it, with no experience whatsoever but I wanted to tell that story more than anything in the world, it was life or death for me and so I left, they let me get on with it, just go, go ahead and do it and they were great, the lecturers and years later when I came back well you see the original one was 30 minutes, it was 28 minutes long, the first one, that came out in late 89 and we got it on at Kirkley the museum, this is after that college had finished I got like um, some, bits, some bits of grant money came in and we got it on at Kirkley the museum who supported me, they were great Phil Philo, still a good mate um, and uh, it ran for an, an, an exhibition, it was shown there daily for about 6 years till the VHS tape wore out, you know <laughs> And so, um, good job it wasn't beaten, Max. I know. There you go. But uh, it was uh, it was all really good. But um, I went on and made lots of other films over the years. I ended up in America and I went to, to Canada and then it was coming back. I was when I was in Canada, I was on the verge of emigrating because there was no work in this area. And eventually, I thought I've got to do something radical. So by about '96, I uh, had a mate in Toronto, so I went and slept on his floor for a while and um, took my my showreel and my CV. And Toronto's got a massive TV and film industry, and um, I, was, I got a job as a cycle courier when my money ran out. So I was, like, delivering parcels all, like, all over the city of Toronto on a mountain bike, which I took me... took Tebbit's advice, took me bike and cleared off, you know. And um, and I was, I was doing 50 mile a day, and I was sticking in these CVs in different places. And I met this guy, and he uh, he goes, yeah, I'll, really, I'll really like to see your stuff, you know. He, he was into historical documentary. Um, and he loved it. Bought me dinner, offered me a job, and I ended up working for him. And we worked on a World War I film about um, Canada, Canada's famous victory at Vimy Ridge. Um, 
which he was calling like the birth of a nation. The Canada came together on its own, in its own right there at that point. Um, and we did this, I was in the battlefield, creating the battlefield and the art department. We had a big reenactment scene and it was uh, really fan fantastic to see. This is in Northern Ontario in November. It was brutal conditions. It was ideal. Mm. It was just mud and slop and trenches. We were digging them and all, and barbed wire and everything. And um, and I was inspired by this. And uh, I came back uh, the next year to get my immigration papers sorted out because I was a go I was gone. I was having a great time, and uh, I'd done my bit here, and I was off. And uh, it took a while for the immigration department to sort the process to claim these things take forever. Well, it was driving me nuts. And while I was back at my mum's in Eston there, twiddling my thumbs, I was running up Eston Hills again, as I did when I was a teenager, when I was a kid, you know. Um, and, I, and, I mean, I love that, I love that place. That's like my, our mountain, you know, at the end of our estate. It was like something special up there. You could just run up there and be free, and you're away from all the urban grimness. And, um, and I was thinking about that original film, which meant so much to me. But I didn't have the skills I'd acquired over the time. That was my I was that was my rookie project, as successful as it was. We sold about a thousand VHS tapes in various shops. Smiths took it. W. H. Smiths took it. First ever local film shown in a local in you know um, on sale in a, in, a, in a, a big chain store like that. Um, and I thought I'd love to make that first film again and make it into the big epic that I, I dreamt about, where I'd, I envisaged. Vaughan going up to discover the Iron Stone in it as a costume period piece and miners going down all these reenactment scenes, which years ago was impossible, but with the digital revolution, of course, suddenly these things became yep. much cheaper to pull off and it was feasible. So I slowly got dragged back into the pit to make that original film into the big thing I ended up making, you know, and I got... It, did, it became a labour of love. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, f money's never been my god, you know what I mean? <laughs> Otherwise, these things wouldn't exist. But uh, that project was different because I had all this like track record at this time. I'd worked in New York with like uh, kids in uh, Harlem and the Bronx. I worked in schools and summer camps in New York and New Jersey, you know, and uh, all good, all good experience. I'd been to Romania to the orphanages on a couple of projects. You know, one film idea was shortlisted by Channel Four, which I was hoping would would have, would, have, would have been a brilliant film about Rod Jones, the uh, local guy who's an like, ex-convict turned. Uh, humanitarian aid worker saved thousands of lives an amazing character from Teesside and I went with him in 94 across to uh, the far side of Romania all of these all of this was good experience which helped me then to build up my um, application um, for big funding for Century and Stone the proper version Mark II if you like you know and then suddenly I got a letter from David Putnam Lord Putnam the producer of uh, the Killing Fields and uh, Chariots of Fire huge the former president of Columbia Pictures and I was living not far from here, just down the road in Middlesbrough there. And he says, um, we want you to apply for up to 75,000, you know. And I was like, wow, you know. So, so if he wants you to apply for up to 75,000, you're probably going to get 75,000. It sounded good, you know. So I, I, if between 25 and 75 grand, and be passionate about what, you, what you're doing. And, um, and that, that was basically the gist. So I went for it. I applied for 69 and a half. I'd have cost it all out. It didn't push me luck too far. <laughs> but a fat enough. I thought, knowing you, you'd probably go for 74 and a half. That maybe. I, I would have done now, maybe. It was a bit more humble than this. You know, I doffed my cap a bit more. Anyway, came back and I got I got the, the full 75. They gave me the lot because they didn't want me to burn out. <laughs> that was how it started. That was in 2002. So I became a Nesta fellow. I was, I was, Nesta was David Putnam's, uh, the organisation set up the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts. And I soon found myself um, in the Houses of Parliament with, uh, with, with Mr Putnam and Mr Miliband and various people in government at the time and loads of um, senior people, um, eminent scientists, artists, you know, I mean, all kinds of people. And there was me, you know, making a film about Esther Nils. I mean... Did you not think, wow, how has this happened? Didn't want to question it. I thought, well, eventually, if you if you keep yourself in the in the zone of possibility, eventually your number comes up, and that was pretty much it, you know. So it was almost like, well, Canada, that can wait. I'm not going back there. I'm doing this. This is what Eston it's all about. For me. Absolutely. <laughs> that was more. It was more important than ever. And the great thing was, some of these old fellas were still around. You see, so I was able to make the film into the dream project that I always wanted to. Have you been surprised though, just how? big it became mm. you know being shown at Cineworld View yeah. in Middlesbrough breaking all sorts of records breaking all sorts of records at the art going around the world an amazing cast of people like you say that that whole period of time those old miners families caught 
Nick just at the right time they were because the last, they were last of the tribe and they've all gone now yeah, you see sadly you know? they're no longer yeah. you managed to get it just mm, in time you had yeah. a great cast yeah. Michael Sheard Michael Sheard of course who was, was in uh, Century of Stone he was yeah, and yeah. He, that was a good that was a great story yeah he was Michael, in Alveda Zane Pet Grange Hill the lo- yeah. one of those actors you know him if you see him he was it. Adolf Hitler in Raids of the Lost Ark yes you know and I went I said I need a voiceover I need an actor to read a quote by Balco and we'll show the statue and we'll have this this quote of this audio read by an actor in a German accent. Which German actors do I know? And uh, the only one I could think of was uh, Michael Sheard in Raiders of the Lost Ark because he played Hitler and Harrison Ford goes up to him. And I was like, <laughs> so I found him online and I, and I phoned him up. He lived on the Isle of Wight. He's from Darlow originally, wasn't he? No, don't think so. The other guy, oh. the, another guy in the film was oh, right. Jason Etherington who played John Marley who was from Darlington. Right, OK. But... Um, and John Marley came from Darlington, you know, amazing. But he was, uh, that was Jason down in London, and he goes, I'd love to come back and do that part, you know. And I said, anyway, so, so Michael Sheer, I phoned him up, and he goes, um, oh, it sounds excellent. And I says, um, he goes, I'll be in London next Tuesday, if that's any good to you. I'm coming across the water from Yellow White, and I says, I'm in London on Monday, I'm coming back on Wednesday, I can do it, purely out of a bit of good fortune. And then I realised, when I watched him on Raiders of the Lost Ark, right, he doesn't actually say anything. <laughs> he just comes, he stands there in the, in the, dressed as Hitler. Harrison Ford approaches him, dressed as a German, and gives him his autograph book. He signs it, kind of nods and walks away. And I went, what's his accent going to be like? So I turned up in London. We, I said, look, I don't know. I haven't got, really got the resources. This is before the big money came in as well. I said, I don't um, want to go to a sound studio and pay ridiculous money just to record three lines. He goes... We'll meet in Victoria, in Belgravia. We'll go to a hotel lobby. We'll walk down a corridor. We'll just record it there and then. I was like, God, totally right on, man. And he was great, real good sport. So we met at the uh, some <laughs> Belgravia Hotel, nodded to the concierge, walked past him, walked down a corridor into a stairwell. And I said, let's do it then. I could tear my camera and sit the microphone in his face. And he just belted out three versions. The first one was OTT, he was like Hitler. You know, it was like, too bombastic. I said, Balto was a liberal. He's, I can imagine he'd be quite a gentle fellow, you know. So he goes, I'll try again. I said, that's fantastic, brilliant. The accent was great. Recorded it, walked back out, nodded to the concierge and cleared off. And we went for a, we went for a drink down the road. <laughs> what a brilliant story. Was, and, and he loved it. We had a real good time. And, uh, and sadly, you know, he died a few years ago. He got cancer not long after. About yeah. I think he died in 2005. But, um, yeah, these little parts of the jigsaw, you know. Sometimes you have to go to inordinate lengths to get just these parts of the jigsaw on screen that last seconds. Um, I think it's about time we played a bit of music here yeah. because we've talked long enough. Yeah. Um, and I always knew you'd be a great talker. First song <laughs> that you want is The Saints, This yeah. Perfect Day. Well, you see, you see, punk rock for me as a youngster was really inspirational because it was just like... It was like, a, like an asteroid hitting the planet and it shook everything up and it was... It was like, wow, you know, this is fantastic. And the DIY ethos of punk, you can get on and do it. I transferred that to, brought that to filmmaking. Now I can make a film, let's get on and do it. And, you know, so seeing as it's such a grim, rainy day, I thought this would be the first track. And it's like John Peel has the Teenage Kicks is his all time favourite. This is mine. I can play this forever. I love it. Weekdays from midday. So Craig Hornby is our after two guest today at BBC Tees. It's hard with Craig because he's done that much in his 32 years on the planet. Um, <laughs> OK, plus that. Um, to get right through everything. We're talking about it. We're talking about it. BBC Tees. Filmmaker. Um, eco-warrior. Um, opinionated historian, filmmaker, as we know. Why is local history important? I mean, we go on about that on the show here, and we love finding out just those tiny little stories which are just like, wow, that's amazing. Why is local history important in your... Well, I think, I think in regards to Teesside, it's because, we, you know, we've, li- we've lived in the shadow of, say, Newcastle for, for a long time as far as the northeast goes, where the poor relation. And then we've got, like, um, well, kind of in between, we're between Yorkshire and between the Georgian nation, if you like, so we, of- we often got forgotten about. We still get ripped apart by the national press with certain programmes we've seen in recent years. It still goes on. Um, but when you, when you tell people from, from around here something about where they live, which it might be a very average, ordinary place, as special as it is to local people, um, and people, oh, well, what's so good about this place or whatever, you know? And then you tell them something, well, on this site, 
you know, 140 years ago, you know, this happened and it was like national news. It was a big deal. And people are like, wow, you know, that's interesting. I said, right here on this spot, Queen Victoria's son came. The villages from California Eston gathered around. The kids read out the national anthem and Balko and Vaughan led three sets of wagons simultaneously down the three inclines as a special presentation. And it was like a big event, you know. Gladstone sailed down the Tees with a flotilla of ships all decorated with flags in 1862. And um, and it was a major event. And even, and even then, you know, and I put that in the film deliberately because I knew these little nuances would be picked up by the local audience. The, the, the London-based press at the time in 1862 scratched their heads while Gladstone would want to go to Middlesbrough, this obscure, dark, satanic place up north, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that, obviously we saw that when Janino came and all the rest of it, remember? So uh, that was nothing new, really. So local history is important because it enthuses people about the place, it gives people an interest, and it makes people think, look at the place differently and want to think, well, isn't it sad that certain places are now neglected? Isn't it sad that our history isn't being you know, cherished or revered or protected or saved like it should be where other towns might have saved theirs. Favour of ignorance, a fair few bulldozers and demolition balls have brought buildings down across the street with the infirmary, you know, tragic, you know. So I, I just think it, it's, um, we're part of history. We're the current chapter. It's just things happening in this area. We're the, we're, we're in existing in the present. We're right in the current. We're right in tomorrow's history, aren't we? Mm. The next chapter is down to us, what we do with it, you know. And if they look back on the early 21st century, late 20th century and say, what did they do then? Wasn't it disastrous? Or wasn't it good? Or wasn't it a bit of both? It's all got to get documented. And it's all got to be, you know, like um, people have to take an interest. It's important. If people don't care about where they live, it's tragic, isn't it? That means that you've had to stick your head above the parapet a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it, I'm six foot seven. I've got no choice, have I? <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, I mean, that has brought you into conflict with mm. authority, yeah. the establishment, yeah. if you want, because of your beliefs. But yeah. I, I'm sure a lot of people would agree there has to be somebody like you for every cause that comes along. There's got, for every thing that might be about to happen, there's always going to be the other viewpoint. Well, I tell you what, And you right? feel passionate yeah. about it. Yeah, of course. Now, the thing is, I when I got into this local history thing, and it hit me like, I mean, this, this, this seminal moment in my life, I was like, wow, I've got this great idea to make a movie. I was thinking, what a tragedy. When I looked into it more, I got angry. And I'm thinking about the Royal Exchange in Middlesbrough, where this was the World Stock Exchange for steel. The price of world steel was set there. This epic palatial building hadn't been cared for, but it could have been renovated and in any other town it probably would Not have been. Not fit for purpose is what I've uh, well, I heard about it. I, they always say this, but I don't believe it. Like Eston Hospital is another one. Oh, it had structural, uh, you know, compromised uh, situation. I don't believe it. These places are, like, so important, and so was the infirmary. Now, they pulled down the Royal Exchange in 1985. I was, like, 18 at the time. I remember seeing it and I thought, well, what a, what a shame. Because me and my mate, actually, there was a, it was boarded up at this point. And one of the boards had come away, and me and my mate, we got through the window in broad daylight and had a walk around it. Just, not vandals, just like curious, you know, behind the scenes of this fantastic building. And there was this great hall. And we thought, let's have a gig. <laughs> let's put a gig on, a squat gig, you know. We'll have a big benefit gig for some <laughs> cause, you know, like Greenpeace or something. And we started going down there with brushes and we were cleaning it out. And we thought, we're going to do this. It's going to be fantastic. People will come from far and wide, you know. Because we were these, we we're into punk and political punk underground sort of business, which was kind of popular then in the 80s. And, um, and then suddenly it was on front page of the get Gazette, Condemned, and it was coming down. Now, they built, a, they built a, a bypass, a motorway through the heart of the historic town, you know, which is like mindless. Where were the people then fighting to save that building? You know, progress. I mean, you are sure. They, of course, they regret it when you look at like, North of the Tees and down by the Tees, there was dereliction all all around. They could have, why would you build a, a motorway through the historic heart of the town? Because they didn't madness. have enough money to build it round it. It was vandalism. It was, it, was, it, was a it was a crime against Teesside, that was. And so when these things happen, and you see, it's, it's a death of a thousand cuts because little things disappear all the time. And so when you get, like, the, you know, the likes of, um, like, the infirmary, the Scientific Institute, demolished on a... On a Saturday night, it was gone by breakfast on Sunday. No, no, no warning to anybody. You know, I mean, it's outrageous. And uh, 
you've got to be vigilant, you've got to protect, because there's people in power don't always have the right ideas or intent. And, and certain people in power, I won't mention any names, but I will say that um, they need guidance from other people with other ideas. I've got the tools to allow people to amplify their voices. So I've, I've worked with the campaigners of Longridge Wood, the Courtham campaign, in the Courtham Common campaigners or in, in uh, Middlesbrough, the women who were fighting to save the pond in the town by Mima. That was going to get built on a few years ago with a multi-storey car park, a hotel and a load of business units in a town full of empty business units. It doesn't make sense. It's mindless. So... Um, that's what I've done, and I've got these films. These films were shown in Parliament. I had two, I had two, two films shown in Parliament in 2009, which was an historic first, you know. We lost one campaign, we, we won another. Do we, are we guilty then, <clears throat> the vast majority of the population, the public, of sticking our heads in the sand? And well, not standing up, and, or if we do stand up, we only half-heartedly do it and shout very quietly, no, this is wrong, instead well, of saying yeah. no... We can't be doing this. Well, you don't. You know, people don't have to take it. You can make a stand against something if you believe in if you believe in it. If you believe in what you're doing. I believe in my films. I'm prepared to make a film about a subject that says, stand up and say, this needs to be seen. People need to know about this. You need to watch this film. That's me being audacious, you know. And that's I don't make any apologies for it. If you don't believe in it, you're not going to stand up and say, you know, watch the film, come to this event, support this demonstration, whatever it might be, you know. Um, you've got to have some conviction and people sometimes need their eyes open and, and there's a lot of people who are passionate and you know, I fortunately have the tools to sort of make films to sort of broadcast the message if you like I'm a messenger Is it a case that the people in power don't consult the general public at large more then? A lot of consultation uh, there's a lot given to consultation lip service but in reality it's about what they want to do most of the time yeah i'm not saying right across the board but on the on the on the most for the most part absolutely i mean saltburn parking uh, cl- uh, crisis last early last year t- uh, january 2013 there was a bigger uh, campaign to stop regular cleveland bringing in parking charges across the town because suddenly we had a parking problem well i live in that town i've lived there for 11 years and nobody believes we have the people who live there and the people who visit there um don't agree with the council there's no parking problem we don't need to be charged to park our cars and that was residents as well so the town rose up massively and um and opposed the, uh, the this uh this plan, an utterly flawed plan. I mean, the people, there's people in Saltburn, some really in, in intelligent people with serious ability who've, who've worked in local authorities and the likes across the country and retired there, and they picked it apart. And so the council gets the most, the greatest um, feedback to any other consultation I've ever done. And the answer was, we think we need to spend £20,000 on further consultation so that we truly understand what the people want and the needs of the town. Well, people were livid, pulling their hair out. Fortunately, they saw sense, and they knocked it back, and it was stopped. And we've lived now since, the, since that time, over a year, and there's been no problem with parking, and it's like people are still coming to town of Saltburn. I love it. I've been living there 11 years. It's a great town. And, uh, and people are very engaged and taking interest. There's loads going on. Um, and because that's, you because know. you're always at the figurehead. Well, always I'm, seems I'm one of, to be. I'm one of them. At the figurehead. I mean, well, I just, the, Eston, the Eston Hills campaign. Well, that came out of nowhere. I love that spontaneity. You don't need to love a bit of spont. But when you're, yeah. when you're there yeah. and you are the person at the head of a campaign or the person who's getting the most publicity for a campaign yeah. against the establishment... Yeah. Well, that wasn't... That you're going to be viewed as a bit of a troublemaker, right? Oh, no, here he comes again, Craig Ormby. Well, if, if, about now? if I wasn't effective, if I wasn't effective, I wouldn't be commented on, I wouldn't make the press, would I? You know, I wouldn't uh, have supporters. But I'm effective, so I've been caused called a troublemaker by people who I'm campaigning against. But, you know, how come th- there's hundreds... I'm not going to get egotistical and say thousands, but <laughs> there's plenty of supporters of people who back me up and uh, and agree with what I say, and I agree with them, and we, you know, you take ideas forward, it's progress. Um, Do you like the fight? Well, actually, it's just a... <laughs> Do I like the fight? It's just a necessary evil, isn't it? You know, I'd like to have a chilled out life, but it doesn't. I mean, I thought I'd have a take it easy for a while, and then suddenly I'm sort of um, lazing me banks for sale from Eston Nab to Wilton Village. Um, 212 acres of Eston Hills is up for sale, and it's like, um, are you gonna, are you gonna start a campaign? We can, I said, 
Looks like I'll have to, you know what I mean? Because I've known thousands of people who bought that film around the world. I've got a massive mailing list, you see. So it was a case of, well, 425 grand. You know, it's a lot of money. I'm not gonna, we're not going to find that overnight. But if anybody's going to do it, I've got the contacts. And I've also, the ice is already broken because people have the, the film and they've already poured their hearts out at me saying how fantastic they thought it was and how it made them cry, you know what I mean? So that was all positive. It boded well and... Um, so we started our campaign back in uh, October, and it was you no know, day and night because we had a deadline. You see, the deadline was December the twelfth for final offers, and the land was split up into eight lots. And so um, we thought, well, if we can't, if we don't raise four hundred and twenty-five grand, which is, a, of course, it's a long shot, but it wasn't impossible. We dare to dream and go for it, and, uh, and in the end, we raised in seven weeks. We raised fifteen grand, all from the public. And we put a, a bid in for lot one, which is Eston Nab, three acres, uh, the actual monument on the top, the rocky, the cliff, which is the Nab, and then um, like 45 acres of woodland beneath. I tracked down the owner of the land, of the whole site in County Durham, knocked on his door, down a, down a private road, knocked on his door one day, told him heart and sleeve, you know, there's a DVD, I've signed it for you, you can have it, it's a present, you'll really like it if you watch it. You know, and um, there's my bagging letter. I said, don't sell it to anybody else. I'm going to move Hell and I Water to try and pull this off. I've got, a, a, we've got a great team. I, they, I mean, three teaching assistants from Will Hill Primary School um, started things off on Facebook, you know, and stayed, stayed this all up. And uh, we formed the Friends of Eston Hills group. We set ourselves up. And they, those girls are fantastic. You know, Rita, Glynn, and Maggie, and, and Lynn as well. We just we worked fantastic as a team, and um, it was really in the trenchy stuff when we pulled it off. You know, we we got the, the the owner wanted to do business with us. We pulled fifteen grand together. We put a bid in for lot one, and he said, "I can't sell you, f- uh, I can't sell you forty five, forty eight acres for fifteen grand because it's eighty grand, you see. He, but I can sell you the top of the mountain." Mm-hmm. And that we said, "Well, that's what that's what we wanted because that's like that's big." big publicity we're buying an iron age bronze age site it's a protected ancient monument you know um and that would be great to buy the top of the mountain and then we'll build our campaign and hopefully go after big lottery fund and that's what we're planning to do next and buy the rest of it and and clean it all up and stop the motorbikes and the quad bikes trashing it you know we did a litter pick just a couple of months back about six weeks ago actually mm. We filled something like 60 bags of rubbish, 30, 30 years of, of garbage off, off the nab. You know, a Coke can from 1987. We found a car door. We found numerous knives and all kinds of stuff. And we cleaned it all up and it, it was spotless. And it looked like a special place that it should be. 13 minutes to three is the time. Um, Craig Hornby is our guest today on the show. You did a, sh- um, a film with Vin Garber as well. Yep, that was like yep. the next big follow-up, which you well, did, which Vin- went around the world again. You did, yeah. Uh, Vin came to see the film Century Stone. I went to see Vin. We had a mutual friend who introduced the two of us. And, um, and I was knocked out by his... By the humour, of course. The fact that he does local songs about this area as well as songs about big global things, big, you know, um, political... Sing a song about... Uh, See so Gisborough, the next breath he'll sing one about Sarajevo or Nicaragua or El Salvador, you know. So it wasn't just local folky stuff, it was big themes as well, and that was really interesting to me. And he'd actually wrote a song about my auntie and my cousin oh, right. 25 years before, um, about this woman from Middlesbrough who fought to uh, save her, have her son operated on in the 60s because he had spina bifida. And, um, and she told a story in the Gazette when he died in 1980. And... Um, and he wrote this song about it. He called a Linda in the song. Well, that Lind- Linda in the song is my auntie Joan. And that was like, this is bizarre, Vin, but you wrote a song about my auntie and my cousin back in 1981. And the family doesn't know, and I've just told her. And she's amazed, you know. She sadly died a few months later. But she found out that he wrote this song about her. So I said, this has to happen. We have to make this film, you know. Because um, we'll, go, we'll I'll come around, I'll come on tour with you wherever you go. So I ended up going to Australia, Malaysia. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> Holland, Belgium, <laughs> Belfast, London. But and, uh, Vin's a bit like a Pied Piper, isn't he? Wherever he, he is, goes, people yeah. just turn out to see oh, him. You can be it. in the farthest off place in Australia. Absolutely. Fascinating. And yeah. he's got such a massive following. Again. Is that what you do? Shine a light, make people more aware of things that that's, are from our area yeah. that are brilliant? Well, if I could, that's a story. Vin's story is unique. 
and he's and he's not. It's not just a, he's hasn't just got a local audience or an audience of expats. I mean, you know, he's got fans all over the place across Britain. He's been touring constantly for forty five years now. You know. Um, and he's loved, and he and he tells people about where he's from, from around this area. People who've never been, or you know, have no clue about the place. And he has them in aesthetics wherever he goes, and he has them thinking about big, big subjects. And um, and it's it's a marvelous blend of all that: serious, completely crackers, daft as a brush, as this, as you know, what's uh, there was a, it has people. Um, uh, tugging heartstrings one minute and rolling in the aisles the next, and it's unique. And um, I just think if he, you know, if he come from anywhere else, he might be more well known. If he was, if he was a Geordie, he would, would have been more well known. I think. Do we have a chip on our shoulder? Um, I have a bag full, mate. <laughs> but uh, so that story had to be had to be told. And and if it if I didn't make that film, it probably would never have been made. It's pretty safe to say that Century and Stone would never would never have been made by television. They would never come here and, and spend that kind kind of time. Time and you know on a project. I don't sort of watch the clock when I'm making a film. I have a, I have a vision and I say, right, I'm going to make this film. Somehow we're going to make the money stretch so we can fund. Uh, I can eat as well as make this film to the best of my ability because it's there forever. And if I know I've done a ninety percent job, it'll irk me forever. And so that's why Century in Stone. I spent years on it because I would never be happy if it was just half a job. And Vin's film had to be made proper, you know. And I kept going back. I need my money, Vin. You know, we got it. We got it. Come with me on this, Craig. Man, you're bankrupting me, you know. But <clears throat> we managed to do it. And he's the only folk legend in this country um, who's got um, who's got his own documentary about his life, you know. And we took it to Cineworld, World, and it over a thousand people went. And and tragically, it didn't get a second week because uh, Shrek three opened on about eight screens. Mm. So, but that's but still, it was on at the multiplex amid all these Hollywood films, and people went to see it and loved it. And it's been shown in Australia and uh, a few festivals and that. What's the next thing you've got lined up? Something to do with World War One, isn't it? World War One and World War Two, actually. Again, just kind of happened. Um, there's a there's a group in Redcar called the Friends of Redcar Cemetery, and they've been working in Redcar doing like local history research as well as caring for the place. For a number of years now, and, um, and they came to me and said they wanted to make a film about Red Car and how the World War, how World War One affected Red Car, basically. So we talked, we talked about it, and then they went off to try and get some money for it, and they got some lottery money funding. Came back, and we've been working on this for a few months. So it's going to get screened at the end of July into early August. Um, you know, it's probably about fifteen, twenty minute piece, you know. Um, about you know how Harley, the Harleypool bombardment in Tees Bay, how that must have terrified people in Red Car who saw it in front of them, you know. Um, and there was a Red Car airfield with the biplanes and everything like that was happening, mm. and that's all that's all very interesting. And the other subject, the other the other project, um, World War Two project, is I put it on the back burner because I'm saving it till next year because um, a, f- a friend introduced me to a friend of his who was a 93 year old former company sergeant major of the Black Bull 8th Armoured Division in the Second World War born in Saltburn, lives in Saltburn and um, and he was sent in 1945 April to liberate a prisoner at war camp and he was sent in with his men and he stumbles across Belson and he, and he was a liberator of Belson, he was wow. there on day one and it's like he was born round the corner from my house. He lives down the road from me now, and he's 93. Fantastic. Eddie Strait, to call him. Eddie Strait, true hero, is the movie. So I've done the rough cut. We showed that at Saltburn Film Festival last October, and uh, it was an Eddie came. We got him to see it on the big screen, and there was a few tears in the audience. It was a great night, you know. It was really moving stuff. Because it's, he- it's a heavy story, of course. And uh, and on the way out of the camp, he, 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 he raided the uh, the the private quarters of the commandant, Joseph Kramer. Kramer was one of the uh, absolute... He was called the Beast of Belson. He got promoted to Belson from the gas chambers at Auschwitz. He was in charge of the gas chambers. And then he sent to Belson, and that was his camp. 10,000 people were, were dead when Eddie turned up, and it was horrendous. And he told me a story, a bloke, and a, a lad from Saltburn, you know, joins the army, goes to London, ends up in the guards at Buckingham Palace, gets seconded to Princess Elizabeth teenage queen you know the queen to be the heir to the throne and he's in charge of he's her bodyguard and the blitz is coming close to the palace and so he has to protect her and this he's given instructions to take her to the to the top of scotland out the way to a safe house a secret location and and he drives her up there you know and um 
and it's like the food is dropped in by plane every couple of weeks and he's up there for three months until this blitz kind of eases off a bit get away you, yeah amazing story isn't it these are the these are the secret stories that are out there but isn't that I mean something we found by doing this show mm. and doing this part of the program is that yes you can interview the most famous person yeah. in the world you can interview the celebs the people mm. from this area that made it big if you want yeah. and it's all brilliant and that's yeah. fantastic but some of the best stories are from the people who live just down the road exactly these are, they're all every every person's experience is relevant, isn't it? You know, from the uh, from the illustrious iron master to the the humble iron miner, iron worker. You know, it's all part of a life. And if you're interested in people and w- what makes them tick, which is basically what I'm interested in, you know, then um, it's, lim- it's limitless, isn't it? Really. How would you like to be remembered when you finally decide to... <laughs> I know it sounds like, you know, you're, you're going to be shuffling off this mortal no coil plans. any second. No, no plans for that, but... <laughs> because you are, have a fairly well-known name in this area. Yeah. OK, I'm... Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not... Um, it's not important, really. What, well, the, the, the legacy is the films. The films will go on for me, and that's fine. I, you know, I, it's, I think it's quite interesting that you can invent something that's never in, been invented before. That film never existed till I made it, whichever film I've made, you know. And it can be there forever. I love that. And you can, you can shuffle off, and that film will be left behind. So, really, you're enriching the generations of the future with something from the past. Is it a bit of a bugbear, though? Yes, you you know, thousands of people have seen these mm. films. Thousands of people have bought the DVDs. Yeah. But still, if you want the major TV channels, yep. haven't shown them. Is that? I mean, you don't set out to make a film for that. I've beat, no, but it would be nice yeah. for the rest of the country to know how important well, of course. the iron, ironworks were well, of in course. Eston, to yeah, know yeah. what a big star Vin is about... Eddie from Saltburn. It was tough to actually swallow that, but I wasn't surprised because um, if you look at um, you know television 25 years ago, there was more regional airtime. On regional BBC, they had more space for regional programmes compared to today. Tyne T's made programmes back then. Tyne T's is just a new studio now, you know. And, um, and it's tragic because, because we have a, a million channels showing all kinds of repeat after repeat and uh, endless... American bilge, that's all I will describe it as. And uh, and it's just dumbing people down, you know. These films I've made would be in, of interest to people on a wide scale. And, they were, and if it was shown, re- if it was shown regionally... Um, but BBC they offered me a 30-minute tw- slot for Century and Stone if I chopped it down by three quarters. Well, it's, t- it justice, it's a two-hour film. It's a big story. It's an epic story. And there was no way I was going to do that, so I, re- I rejected it, you know. So... Um, it doesn't surprise me if I if I made if I made if I made films within the confines of what TV wants. I probably I wouldn't be happy doing it, even if it paid me. I'd rather make the films I want to make on my shoestring budget. Um, to my you know I, I have creative control, and um, and that's the only way to make those films. Otherwise, it's all compromised and it's pa- rendered powerless. You know, ineffective really. But the fight continues. Of course. Life goes on. You've got to do something interesting with your life, otherwise what's the point, you know? You can hear and virtually feel his passion for the area <laughs> and the heritage, so says Roy. I really enjoyed listening to that. Right. In fact, I'm going to go listen again. Good luck in all that he does. Cheers, Roy. Nice one. Craig, it's been great talking to you. We have some, we more, should... some more music then, or what? <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time. Have we? It's oh. three o'clock. I tell you what, we'll get you back in. We'll get you back in. We'll talk some more. Nice it is fantastic, Craig. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks a lot, man. Cheers. It's great talking to Craig Hornby today. I mean, that story of Eddie from Saltburn. Wow. <laughs> and if you haven't seen *A Century in Stone*, or the film about Vin Garbett, or any others, um, check out Craig uh, on his website. Search for Pancrack. Productions, P A N C R A C K, Pancrack. Uh, and there's all the links to all the bits and pieces that he's done and other things there as well. But trust me, if you've not seen Century in Stone or the Vin film, absolutely incredible. Thanks to Pam um, for the message there. What a fab guest. And loads of other people getting in touch about that interview with uh, Craig Hornby. Tomorrow, um, we have Journey South on the show. <laughs>